Awesome. Uh, well, guys, again, thanks for being here. Uh, we are uh, finishing up our series, Heart Shifts. Have you guys enjoyed this series? Has it been good? I've, I've sincerely enjoyed uh, this whole conversation on these habits that we're supposed to have in our walk with Jesus, right? These, these things that are important to the daily walk. And this time, we didn't just look at what they were or how they're supposed to look, but the heart behind them, right? The why behind what we do and why we do it in our walk with Jesus. And so we're going to do that one more time today. Uh, and we're going to talk about some community. I'm just going to let you know, okay, some community in our lives. But before we do, I have to, I have to admit something, okay? This is kind of heavy. I am a breaker of phones. You're like, what? <laughs> I am terrible with my phone, okay? Phones in general. I've had an iPhone now for a while, since I was like a sophomore in high school or something like that. I think I started with the four. You remember the four? Yeah, that's what I started with, right? It was like this big. <laughs> now they're this big. Um, but... I am terrible with phones that are just literally covered in glass. I have not owned an iPhone that I have not broken, okay? Except for the one that's on that chair right now. So pray for it because I'm its owner. Literally, I've just destroyed phones. Uh, there was one time even, this was, I had an iPhone 8, and you can ask some of the students about this. Dane's nodding his head and Aspen too. They're like, yeah, I remember this. I had a curved iPhone. You're like, wow, that's unique. No, it was bad. Um, it's from sitting on it so much. Literally, I pulled it out. The cool thing is it shaped my face really well. <laughs> but it was so thin that it, like, it just was like this after a while. You know what I mean? And all the students were like, let me see. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm, I've been terrible with phones. Anyways, all that to say, one time I broke a phone. I had to go get it fixed, okay? I had to get the screen fixed, okay? Who's done a screen replacement before? Lots of places you can go. More of us, come on, don't be shy. It's real. So I went to this place. I'm not gonna name the place to get it fixed. Um, and uh, it wasn't the Apple store. I'll just say that. It was somewhere else. And they replaced my screen, right? It's like, oh, we can fix iPhone screens. Cool. They did it. Came back like the next day. Got my phone. Was excited. Looked brand new. Clean, beautiful. Started to use it. It wouldn't work. Like, and here's how it wouldn't work. I would get a call. Answer the call. Hello? No noise, right? You know the screen is, is connected to the top part of this, like the, the, the speaker on there. So it's like no noise. I was like, that's weird. It worked even when it was, you know, shattered <laughs> and I could talk to people. So I took it back in. I was like, hey, this isn't working. They're like, oh, we'll fix that. No worries. Next day, come back, get the phone again. More issues. This time the screen wasn't working when I tried to slide it and move things. Just issue after issue after. I was like, hey, something is going on. So I made the choice. I was like, I'm not going to go to this place anymore. I'm going to go to the actual Apple store, to a place where they have iPhones, the people that made this phone, and ask them to fix it. So I did that in Oklahoma City. I went in there. When I told the guy what was going on, the store I'd been to, he was like, ah, yeah, we get that pretty often. I was like, what does that even mean, dude? And he was like, so like what happens is, and this is not for every store, so don't go, Pastor Ricky told me, okay, this is just one example, but he was like, a lot of stores will use off-brand screens. They will not use the product that Apple itself creates and sells with their original iPhones when they send them out. Makes sense, right? It's so like other people create these same screens, but they don't always work the best. So I was like, okay. So they gave me an Apple screen, an actual one from their store, came out, the phone worked perfectly. Praise God, right? This is so cool. The reason I tell you this is because I think there's a point here that authenticity matters. When I went to this other store, they gave me some off-brand screen and it did not work right. The quality was a, was a bit lower. I go to the place where maybe it costs a little more. I can't remember. I think I had insurance. Who knows? But it was the real product. It was the authentic product that was meant for my phone, and it worked wonderfully. Authenticity matters. Why does it matter? Here's a few reasons. One, when you have something that's authentic, it usually comes with value. Amen? It's like you think of like authentic baseball cards, and it's like they, those things are pricey. Why? Because they're the real deal, right? They are the authentic thing, and because they're the real thing, they're valuable. They're, they're important, so they hold a lot of value. The other thing, quality, like I said. When we get something that's maybe not the real thing, the authentic thing, the quality kind of drops. It's okay. It probably won't last us as long as the real thing would. But when you've got the real thing and you, you've maybe paid a couple more pennies for it, your quality is bound to go up. Amen? And then the third thing is just peace, right? When you choose something that's authentic, something that has value and has quality, you kind of get this inner peace where you're like, I know I'm in a good spot. I didn't buy this thing that's just gonna give out on me in two days. I got this thing that's gonna last. And there's some inner peace in there, 
right? So again, authenticity matters. And I'll give you this quick disclaimer, okay? This does not, this, this authenticity matters and it being valuable and quality is better. It's like, that doesn't fit everything, okay? That's not just like a, 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 st- a sticker that you slap onto every situation, every item, everything. Because I will say this, and I will say this to the day I die. Off-brand cereals are elite. <laughs> it's a fact, okay? I'm just saying, some of y'all know, you're like, yeah, Fruit Loops, no, Fruityos. You're like, those are it. You know what I mean? It's like, that's what, I'm just saying. So it, you can't just slap that sticker on everything, everything and say, well, the real version is better. Not always true, okay? So I don't, I don't mean to push that t- today or say that, but authenticity does matter. It is valuable, but it, it all depends on what we're talking about, okay? It all depends on, on, on the what of what we're saying is authentic. One place where authenticity always matters is relationships, It's community. Like I said, that's what we're talking about today. Authentic relationships, authentic community. That is where authenticity matters. Because if not, things can get weird. Amen? Things can end up how they were not supposed to be. So I'll give you a quick story really quick. Uh, Rachel and I have this friend, uh, and this friend is somebody that we've known for a really long time. So usually when you know somebody for a really long time, you probably get closer to them, right? Right? Like you connect with them better. You begin to trust each other more. You show up when things are needed. Like they're your person when things get rough. They're, your, they're gonna show up when things are hard. You have those friends that you've known for a long time. You built that relationship. And over time, you've just gotten real, real close. That's how it usually works to, for the most part, right? Well, this situation with this friend wasn't that. So again, we've known this person for a long time, but even knowing them and getting to where we are today, we don't have that kind of relationship. What we recognize is over time with this person, things never really changed. Things never got to a deeper level. We never really got closer, not because we didn't want to, but it's almost like they weren't interested in it, okay? They weren't interested in being a part of the deeper connection. They were interested in having those more connecting and deeper conversations. They weren't interested in showing up when things were hard. And I'm not up here just to vent and to, to, to complain about a friend or anything like that. I do have a point, I promise, but really what Rachel and I realized about this friend is they weren't really interested in showing up. How many of you guys know it's valuable to have people in your life, have community in your life that shows up when things are not the best? Amen? I will say this. We can't always show up. That's the flip side of the coin, right? Sometimes we need boundaries. Sometimes we have stuff that we have to prioritize because it's called to have the priority in our lives, other relationships, other things going on. That's so, so real. But as a whole, Man, is it a great thing? Is it an important thing to have people in your life who will show up, who will be there for you when you need it, who will be that shoulder, will be that strength, be that supporting person or that supporting group, whatever that may be? It's valuable, it's important, and it is absolutely needed. This friend was not that person. They missed out on a lot of things. We invited them, and they just would never show up. Things like our, our marriage, when we, got, when we got married, our wedding, when our kids were born, there was times when Rachel needed a, a really close friend and this was the only person that she thought she could go to and they, they were never available. And again, I, I'm, I don't want to bash. I'm not trying to say this person's a bad person. They're a good person. But they weren't that friend that would show up for us. If you've ever been in this spot, then maybe like us, you've been left feeling alone, right? When it comes to community, you think, well, I don't really have any. Maybe you've been left frustrated, like, why would, why do they, they're supposed to be my friend. Why don't they ever show up? That's my community, but... They're not showing up how I think community is supposed to. Maybe you've been left just confused or lost, or maybe you've just been left feeling unvalued. That person just doesn't see me as somebody important. They don't see showing up for me as something significant. Have you ever been there? I think a lot of us have. And sadly, because human beings are human beings and and we make mistakes, a lot of us probably will. We're not always there when we could be or should be. And again, there's boundaries. There's things like that that are important. But showing up matters. Being authentic community is so, so important. A couple of the reasons why is because there's this danger zone, okay? If we don't believe that showing up is important, if we don't believe that having those kind of people in our life is significant, then we are putting ourselves on this path to believe one of two lies, The first lie is that authentic community is just unattainable for us. It's unavailable. You ever thought that before? Maybe you've been hurt by some people. Maybe you've had people not show up for you so much so that you just thought, this is how it is. This is what life is like. It's 
people failing me or not showing up when I hoped they would over and over and over again, right? So maybe I get to this mental space where like, well, I just won't expect that anymore. I won't expect people to show up for me, to love me, to take care of me, and to support in other ways maybe that I have for them. It's just kind of how it goes, right? It becomes a truth in our mind. Those kind of friendships and communities just don't exist. So that's one, that authentic community is unavailable to me. The second lie we might believe is that I don't need it. And this is where the heart gets kind of hardened. Maybe I don't need or I don't want that community because I've been hurt by them too many times, because of what they've done to me, because they never, maybe because of what they never did for me, because they didn't show up. And so now I've gotten to this place in my mind where I'm like, hey, this whole life and me getting through it, it's, it's alone. That's how it's supposed to be done. It's my responsibility. The weight is all on my shoulders. I'm called to do this by myself. My struggles are mine to figure out. And honestly, if you get as frustrated as I've been in the past, you get to a place where you go, you know what? I don't need them. And as a matter of fact, it's none of their business. They don't need to know what's going on. That's hurt talking. Do you see these lies? Because that's what they are. They're lies that the enemy wants us to believe when it comes to God's vision and God's plan for people to love one another, for people to prioritize one another, to do life together. And the truth is today, authentic community, it is available to you. It is available to every single one of us. You are worth it. You are worth people showing up, right? And truthfully, we need each other. We need authentic community. We need people who care about us, who love us, maybe with no agenda behind it, you know, and who want to show up when it's needed. So what we're going to do, like, like I said, is this whole series we've looked at, all these habits, these important things that we're called to have in our walk with Jesus. So we're going to take it one more, take a look at one more, this community one. Uh, and again, the goal is to figure out why it's so important. Why do I need this authentic community in my life? What difference is it really going to make? Tell me the why. But to do so, we have to look at what. What is authentic community supposed to look like? Because I don't know about you guys, but in my life a lot, I've either done or been shown from others what it's not supposed to look like. Amen? People have let us down. I've let people down because I have not fully learned what it looks like to be that authentic community, that healthy community. So what does it look like? Because the what will show us why. And so to do that, we're going to look at three different stories in scripture. So if you got your Bible, now's the time to pull it out. If you're taking notes, great. If you're not, Get after it because it's important, okay? We're gonna get some good stuff today. And these are fun stories that we're gonna walk through and learn from, some things we'll learn about authentic community. The first one comes from the book of Ruth. How many people in here have read the book of Ruth or heard of Ruth before? We're talking about two ladies, Ruth and Naomi, okay? So just a little background on Ruth and Naomi. Uh, Naomi is actually Ruth's mother-in-law. So Naomi has been through it, y'all. If you don't know about Naomi, she has been through the ringer. Uh, In Ruth, it talks about her, and it starts by saying, hey, Naomi lost her husband. Naomi had two sons. After Naomi lost her husband, her two sons got married. Uh, one uh, One of the girls was Ruth, right? And the other one was Orpah. So Orpah and Ruth married Naomi's sons. Not long after her husband dies and after they get married, uh, her two sons, Ruth and Orpah's husbands, they pass away. So Naomi's whole family has just been taken. They're completely gone. So you can imagine Naomi's in a really rough spot. She's shattered. She is broken. Uh, And her heart is just torn apart because of all that she's experienced. So she kind of gets to this place because of what she's been through to where she feels like God has kind of turned her back or his back on her. He's like, yeah, she thinks God's got her. She's like, God has his fist against me. God has taken away my family. He's taken all my stuff. She gets to this place of hopelessness. We've all been through stuff. We've all experienced really big hardships and, and, and struggles, and, and we know those thoughts, right? We know what those things are, and Naomi is deep in those right now. So she makes this choice. She hears word that there's some good stuff happening back where she's from. And she goes, hey, I'm going to travel from here where my husband and, and my son's passed away, and I'm going to go back to where I'm originally from, and I'm going to kind of start over, figure this out. But she's broken, and all along the way, she's like, God has forsaken me. I'm left. There's nothing else. So Ruth and Orpah, they see this because they are now widows as well and they're going through it and they decide to go with Naomi. They're like, hey, we'll come with you. And originally Naomi's like, great. Well, as they begin to travel, Naomi hits this point. She goes, you know what? That hopelessness is really just kicking in, that brokenness. And she goes, don't come with me. You guys are better off being away from me. 
I'm nothing. I've just got brokenness. God has turned against me again. His fist is against me. You guys are better off going back to where you're from and starting over. Start new. Figure it out a different way. I've got nothing to offer you. There's nothing but brokenness when you come with me. Right? So Orpah, the other wife of one of her sons, decides, okay, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and start her again. That's, that's not a bad thing. She's got stuff. She just lost her husband. She's got to figure this all out. She needs to heal with her and, her and the Lord, right? She's got to walk this all out. It makes sense. So she goes back to what she knows. She's going to start fresh. But Ruth, Ruth responds a little differently. So when Naomi tells him to go home, here's what Ruth says back to her. Ruth 1, 16 through 18. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Do you see this? This is crazy, right? So Naomi's like, go home. I've got nothing for you. It's just hopeless and it's all broken. And again, she's been through a lot. It makes sense for her to be responding this way. And Ruth's like, uh-uh, girl, I'm coming with you. You know, you ever had those friends, you know, talk about legit ride or die. They're like, I'm right here. Like we're getting after it. And this is Ruth. So much so that she's like, may God punish me severely. If I even make the choice to go, maybe I should go back. No, 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 no. I was meant to be right here. You see what Ruth, I think, has, has discovered. Again, this isn't in the plain text, but we can see it from her heart and her response is this idea that she feels like God has called her to this moment. She feels like this is exactly where she's supposed to be. That it wouldn't be wrong like Orpah to go back home and start over. She's broken too. She's got a lot of weight. And if she decides to stay with Naomi, who's really hopeless and broken right now, she's probably gonna have to carry some of that weight too. May not seem fair, right? It's like, girl, figure out your stuff first. But Ruth's like, no, I'm staying right here. And Ruth has no idea what awaits her, right? She could go back home to what she knows, what's familiar. That's, that's comfort, folks. That feels good. That's known. It makes me feel like I have more of a chance of changing things, of succeeding. But Ruth's like, no, I'm gonna go into the unknown. I don't know if good things await Naomi and I when we get to her place. I don't know if I'm gonna have to deal with this forever, if things are just constantly gonna be broken, if it really is hopeless, I don't know, but I know that God is calling me to this person. God is calling me to love Naomi right now, so I'm gonna go. Here's the first point. Authentic community brings support. When we surround ourselves with people who love us and care for us, we receive support. We need Ruths in our life. We need people who go, hey, I'm going nowhere. <laughs> I'm right here with you every step of the way. I don't know what's ahead. It could be real bad, but I love you. I want nothing from you. I just want to help take care of you. Do you see that? Isn't that such a beautiful thing? Isn't that, if we're being honest, oftentimes really unheard of? To go, I, I want no benefit. I don't care what comes my way. God has called me to this place right next to your side, and I'm going to stay here. We need Ruth's in our life. If you know how the story goes, um, at the end of the book of Ruth, uh, or throughout the whole story, so uh, excuse me, Ruth ends up marrying a wealthy man named Boaz, and uh, Ruth and Boaz uh, end up, uh, she, Ruth ends up getting pregnant, and she has a son, and they name him Obed, and Obed is to be the grandfather of King David. So you see this whole lineage and this really cool kind of passing down. And we know where King David's line goes, just this beautiful picture. But this really cool moment happens where Naomi and these, these other women in the town, they come around here and they go, look what God has done. There was brokenness and there was taking away. There's stuff that was take, like just completely gone, destroyed, and you felt hopeless. And God is coming and he's restored that. God has given you another son, a grandson. And one day, she doesn't know this, but that's the grandfather of King David. And that's this beautiful, broken, but beautiful line that she gets to be a part of, that God has pulled her into. Do you see the restoration of the father coming in there? Say, hey, that brokenness is not all that's there. And do you see how somebody coming in, Ruth coming in and saying, hey, I'm right here, helped her get to that place. The, the women in the town, it's actually said a few times, the women in the town and some other people, when they talk to Naomi about Ruth, they say, 
Ruth has been better to you than seven sons. Better than seven other human beings. This girl has poured out for you. She has loved you and taken care of you. That is real support. That is real, authentic community. We need Ruths in our lives. And for some of us, maybe we've got some people like that, but are we being a Ruth to somebody else? Have we looked at our friends who are saying, hey, I need some help. I need some support. And are we stepping into those places? Again, boundaries, necessary. But is there a place that God is calling us to prioritize where he's saying, you better stand right there. And are we staying and saying, all right, God, I trust you. Even though I don't know what, what, what lies ahead, I'm here for this person, God. I don't know that's what all is going to come my way, what their baggage is going to be, what their burdens might be, but you're in control. I trust you. So I will stay right here. We need a Ruth and we need to be a Ruth to others. Authentic community brings support. Okay, the next story. So this one is with uh, King David. How nice, chronologically, right? I set that up. No, I didn't. It just happened. But King David and Nathan, okay? So this is a really cool one. It's kind of heavy, but it's really, really good. So uh, I'm going to move through this one pretty quick because it can be longer. But King David is king already. And one day he's walking on top of his palace on the rooftop. He sees a woman named Bathsheba. If you know the story, you know that he sees her bathing naked and he goes, I want, and then he has people go get her, and they bring her in. This is terrible, but they bring her in. He sleeps with her, and he gets her pregnant, right? This whole time, she's been married, okay? She's married to a man named Uriah. What happens is she, they find out she's pregnant, and King David's like, uh-oh, you know what I mean? I made a mistake, and Uriah comes home, and David's like, oh, here's what I'll do. I'll just make Uriah sleep with her or like try to convince him that he should go home and sleep with his wife so that it doesn't look like it's my kid and I'm free. Uriah is a good man. He's like, no, I've got people at war. I'm not going to go sleep in a nice bed while my friends are sleeping in fields and fighting people. It doesn't feel right. So he doesn't go home to see his wife. Now King David's like, I'm in real trouble, right? And so he's like, I don't know what to do. So he comes up with this terrible plan. He sends Uriah back to battle to the front lines where Uriah is killed. A man after God's own heart. <laughs> right? Terrible stuff. This is King David, and he does this thing. The worst part is, is that as time goes on, Bathsheba, she mourns for Uriah, but then her and King David are married. They have their son, and David gets to this place where he just goes, all right, it is what it is, and it's almost, and you read the scriptures, it's almost like he's like kind of sweeps it under the rug, and he's like, I'm just going to keep doing life. I'm just going to keep being king. And there's no kind of conversation of, I messed up. No repentance, no rebuke, nothing. Until God sends a man named Nathan. Nathan is a prophet who hears from the Lord and he goes to David on God's behalf. And he talks to him. He tells him this story about a rich man who steals from a poor man. And the rich man steals the poor man's one and only lamb and sacrifices it for some guests that he's having over. And the, the rich man had plenty of lambs, but he takes the poor man's one lamb, right? Steals from him. So Nathan tells David this story, and here's how David responds in 2 Samuel. Verse 5 says, David was furious. Chapter 12, excuse me, verse 5. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. So you see from the get-go, David's like, this is not cool. So you know David can recognize wrong, right? Despite the fact that he did what he did with Bathsheba and all this other stuff and tried to go on like nothing was going wrong, he knows when people are doing things they shouldn't be doing. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. So David recognizes it. He's like, this is wrong. Here's what Nathan says. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. David, you're frustrated about this guy stealing from this other person, doing something he shouldn't do, taking something that was not his. You are that man. And of course, he's not saying, this is actually, you did this. I watched you steal somebody's lamb. It's like, no, no, no. This is Uriah. This is Bathsheba. This is your new son. You are the man. Nathan rebukes David. David falls down and he repents. And he asks God, begs God for forgiveness. And Nathan comes in and is like, dude, God's gonna forgive you. God still loves you. You're still king of Israel. There will be consequences, but you are forgiven. Second point, authentic community brings accountability. We need people in our lives who can come up and go, you are the man. This is not it. You cannot be doing things this way. This is not going to lead to good things. It's going to lead to more brokenness. I think I've shared this story before a couple years ago, but um, Reed, I've mentioned a man named Reed. He's basically my dad. He's a father figure in my life, my best friend Colin's dad. Um, I lived with them while I was in high school for a little bit, um, and I became one of their kiddos, lived in their house, and they, were, they are family. Well, uh, 
shortly after I, Rachel and I got married, um, I was in this space, right? I was a husband and a father now because we had Liam and uh, I was still 19 years old. And so I still wanted to be a 19 year old and like wanted to spend a bunch of times, a bunch of time with my friends. And I did that. In fact, I spent more time with my friends than I did my wife and my son because I was in this weird space, not an excuse, but a weird space of like, I'm 19 and this is what 19 year olds do. But also I just became a father and a husband, right? So I was in this weird place of kind of struggling with that and leaning more, landing more with like, I'm going to spend time with my friends and away from home. Well, one night Rachel and Liam were at home sick and I went over to Colin and Reed's house to get something and I stayed there way too long and was hanging out with some friends who were already there. Uh, and Reed comes walking in the back gate uh, and I'm on his back porch and he comes up and usually, you know, we joke and laugh and say something funny. And he just looks at me and he goes, what are you doing on my porch? I was like, chilling. <laughs> And he goes, you have a sick wife at home. You have a a newborn son who's sick at home. And you're sitting here just hanging out. Go. And then he walked away and walked inside the house. I was mad. I didn't like say nothing because I don't do that. You know, it's just inside. I was real mad, you know. I was like, I can't believe he just said that to me. So I left, super embarrassed, super upset. That upset about the situation turned into me being upset with myself because I realized he was right. I went home that night and I'll be real, I cried. I was real mad, real upset with myself. Apologized to Rachel like a thousand times. Liam was asleep and I was like apologizing to a newborn baby. I'm so sorry. But I needed to hear, hey, Ricky, you're that man. You're doing something you shouldn't be doing and you cannot keep moving this way. Things have to change. Because if you don't, your marriage is going to get worse. Your relationship with your son will not be healthy. Things are going to happen that they're not supposed to. It's not what you're called to do. So I needed to hear. I needed that accountability. We need reeds in our life. We need Nathans, people who come up and go, hey, this is not it. You are that man. This has to change, right? And it does not mean that they shame us or make us feel guilty and break us down and, and treat us terribly. It's not, it's not what we're looking for. Galatians 6, 1 says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Gently and humbly go to that person and go, hey, I love you, but you're being real dumb and you should stop and I want to help you. I want to remind you that you're awesome, you're forgiven, God still loves you, you're important, but there is more here. God has better, God has more, and the way you're walking is not the right way. Let's get back on the right path. Let me help you. Let me hold you accountable and be a friend who simply just wants what's best for you. Again, there's nothing for that person in that conversation. Them holding you accountable, it's probably awkward. They probably don't want to do it. I know I'm that person. If I have to tell somebody, you got to stop doing that, I'm like, hey, you should stop but we need it. Amen. We need people who go, this is not it. We need Nathans. We need Reeds. And we need people who love us and want what's best for us. And because of that, they'll help us get back on the right track. So again, authentic community brings accountability. Third and last one. This is about a man named Paul and another man named Timothy. So if you know about Paul, Paul is a church planner, right? Helped build the early church in an amazing way. Went around all over, just planting churches in different places. And uh, there's a man named Timothy, a young man, right? Teenager who was like, hey, I feel called to what you're doing. I love what you're doing. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And so Timothy decides to, uh, or Paul decides to mentor Timothy and says, come along. Let's go do all this. Let's go reach people for Jesus and spread the good news. And eventually, after being mentored for so long, Paul tells Timothy, hey, there's this place called Ephesus. There's a church that's there. You're going to lead that church. Timothy's like, dude, I'm just a kid and I'm so young. I don't I don't know if I can do this. So he steps in. He's like, all right, I'll lead it. And what we see uh, and kind of can see throughout the scripture is that there's some people who look at Timothy and they're like, you're too young, man. Like you're, you're too young to actually be leading this church. You're too young to really know what you're doing to take care of this and make this all happen the way that it's supposed to, right? And so Paul writes these letters to Timothy. And in 1 Timothy, he says this to him, uh, 1 Timothy 4.12, Timothy, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. But be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. So Paul comes in and he's like, dude, people are going to tell you a thousand reasons why you shouldn't or are not who God says you are. Why you shouldn't be, why you can't be, right? Age, right? Because of who you are, because of what you've been through, because of uh, of the mistakes you've made, whatever it may be. People are going to go, no, it's not you. 
And they're going to bring discouragement. They're going to bring that negativity. But should we let their voices outweigh the voice of God? Should we let the thoughts that the enemy is trying to use them to put into our minds overcome who God says we are and what he's called us to do? No way. And so Paul comes in, he's like, Timothy, don't forget that. God has called you to this place. God has called you to lead this place. He's called you to bring the good news and to do good things, and he is with you, and that is what matters. Authentic community brings encouragement, folks. That's the third point. We need people around us who can come in and remind us and encourage us towards what the the Lord has for us. A reminder of, hey, here is who you are because Jesus says so. Here is what you should do because this is what God has called you to, to get us back on track with the Lord. Not worried about what other people saying, not letting those thoughts, because I know, I know, I'm, I'm one of those people. Insecurity is a battle. For people to come in and go, hey, this, 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 you're this, you're that, you didn't do this well enough, da, da, da. or just let the thoughts of myself, let the, let the enemy put thoughts in my mind that I let spin around for too long and they begin to outweigh and overpower God's heart for me. But that is not the plan. We need, a count, or we need an authentic community that comes in and brings encouragement that reminds us of the truth and pushes out the lie so that we can keep stepping forward. Anybody in here a fan of motivational sports movies? I'll raise two hands because I asked. Come on, y'all. Don't be scared. Some of y'all know you'll be crying. Like, oh, that's so beautiful. That's me, yo. Like, oh, man, I used to, I watched like every Rocky movie when I was like eight years old and I was, I was gonna box, you know what I mean? But it's like those halftime moments or the, 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 the corner in the ring, you know what I'm saying about when like your guy's getting beat up and you're like, he's going to lose the fight, and, you know, and then his trainer comes over, or the coach comes in the locker room and is like, ah, you know, <laughs> like we can do this and just encourages them and reminds them, you guys got this. You worked for this. This is, this is where you're supposed to be. We need that. And not just for random little moments to be like, I'm super encouraged. You know what I mean? It's like, but to really be like, no, this is a fact. You can do this. Not because you're strong enough, not because you're great and perfect and all these things. You are, you're amazing, but God makes it so. God gives us what we need. And because of him, we can win that. We can move forward. We can be successful in what he's called us to do. It doesn't matter what other people say, but we need those moments, which means we need those people. Authentic community brings encouragement and we need that. All right, ultimate why, okay? So get ready to close that. Ultimate why. Why do we need authentic community? Not just people surrounding us, not just faces in a crowd. Why do we need people who really show up? Why is it important? Simply because we were made to do life together. It's how we were literally created. You're like, that seems very obvious for sure, but we don't get it right. We were not created to go at this world alone, to try to figure it out ourselves, to carry the weight and to say, it's, it's, it's my responsibility, it's all me, and I, I'll get it figured out. We've got the Lord, but one way the Lord works, right? One of the ways in his beautiful creativity and, and, and all the things that he can do, he comes and he goes, hey, I, I built others, <laughs> and I wanna use others. I'm gonna use them through my power and my glory to help you, to support you, to encourage you, to shoot you straight, and to get on to you when I need to, but because I love you. We need one another. We were not created to do life alone. We were made to do life together. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You hear that and you're like, that's a wedding verse, Pastor Ricky. <laughs> yeah. Sure is, you can use it there. But this whole passage is not just about a man and a wife, right? This is like this is about companionship. This passage is about people coming together, people in general and saying, You're worth it. I'm worth it. Let's do this together. God has called us, He's with us, we can make this happen. We were not created to do life alone. We need each other. This last week, okay? And again, a spouse fits in that, okay? I can't tell you how many times Rachel Bustos has come up and been the voice of God in my life and say, boy, you better straighten up. You know what I mean? It's like, yes, man. Because she's right. She's got it. She hears the Lord and she's helping me. God's using her in mighty ways in my life too. We need that companionship with others, with those close to us, family members, friends, everybody. So 
this last week, our staff was watching this kind of online conference, uh, and there's a gentleman named Henry Cloud, and he, we were listening to him talk, and he had this quote that he said, this thing that he said that I was like, oh, that's real good. So he said this, he said, God is the only, and I don't have a slide, God is the only self-sustaining being. Did you hear that? God is the only self-sustaining being. We draw life from outside of ourselves. We, we can't just make it happen. Like, I need help. I need the support. I need, I'll just, whew, self-made doesn't work. We need input. We need things to be flowing in. We need the life that God brings to be poured into us. And one way, again, that he's going to do that is through other people. We need to allow other people to come in, but we need them to be authentic. We don't just need faces. We don't just need people filling the crowd. We don't just need people who don't always show up. We need people who are going to be there, who want to encourage us, hold us accountable, all the things, guys. We need that self, we, we can't self-sustain. We need that to be poured in, that input to be poured in so that we can be who God has called us to be. Two things. What do we do with this, right? You've heard the, the, the why, because we weren't created to do this alone. But how do we step into community? How can we start? What steps can we take? I wanna give you two. The first one is literally step in, okay? Like actually step into community, I'm not going to have us raise our hands, but like think about it. How many of us are, would actually say we're in a good, healthy, authentic community right now? How many of us would say that we've got a good amount of people who are good with their boundaries, but show up for us in ways that encourage us, that hold us accountable, that lead us to do better, right? That support us when we're broken. How many of us would say we've actually got that? Like it's just real good. Sadly, I'd say a lot of us probably don't. Or maybe we have, but we're in a season where we don't. And if you do, praise God, don't let that go. We need it though. And one of the things that we have to do to be a part of it is be willing to step in. It requires a step, right? Here at Grace, we have life groups and we talk about them all the time because we have seen God move in these things. Josh said it last week, he said, Rose don't know. And you're like, what, you don't know? What are you talking about up here? You know what I mean? It's like, what does that even mean? You're right. It's like, no, he's, he knew exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about sitting on a Sunday and not understanding, like you, you hear stuff, but not understanding that we need to be in this circle with people who also want to know Jesus and be in relationship with him and who can just do life together with one another, who can hold each other accountable, who can love one another, who can teach each other, where we can be real and authentic and raw and transparent and there's no judgment and we need it. The Holy Spirit wants to come in and move in those places and that's why we push them so hard. So I want to encourage you, if you're not in a life group, maybe that's your step. Take a look. We've got a lot of different options. Go to our website. Look at the seat back in front of you. Go to the Connect Desk. Ask a staff member. Ask a volunteer. Let's get you plugged in. We want that for you because we believe God moves in huge ways in those groups. We want to see him help you find that authentic community that we need so that we can do life together, so that we can grow in our walk with Jesus. That's what it's all about. But we need them. So step in. Try something out. Don't overdo it, right? Like Pastor Ray, you told me to join life groups, so I joined nine. It's like, that was a bad choice. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, well, I've seen it. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> and then you're burnt out, right? And then maybe you get back to that place of like, I'm hurt, man. I, I just can't, it's too much. You weren't called to be friends with everybody. You can love everyone, but they don't need to be your authentic community. Not everybody can, and you can't be that for everybody. Step in. The second thing, kind of like I just said, protect space for authenticity. You have to protect this space. I one time heard an illustration about a Lego and that we as human beings are like Legos. Legos have only so many studs on them, right, that you can connect to. The same is true for us. We have only so many studs where we can have relational connections. Eventually we try to build on and it becomes too much. Protect those spaces. Protect those connections. Let them be authentic. Let them be real. Again, you were not called to be everybody's friend and everybody was not called to absolutely have to show up for you every single time. But we need those core, those few that God sends our way and says, you guys are gonna do life together. You guys are gonna figure this out together. Protect that space for authenticity. Some of us are on the other side of this. And maybe we're like learning about community. We're getting more plugged in, but we feel like we're not seeing it as much in our lives. Maybe, just maybe, and I'm not accusing you of anything, maybe you need to be the authentic community that you want. Not that you rely on yourself, but start being what you're looking for to other people. You're like, I want people who are understanding, who don't assume, understand, don't assume. Be that to somebody else. I want people who are transparent and raw and they just tell me their story. I'm not gonna judge them. I want people who are judgment-free. Be judgment-free, be transparent, be raw. Share your story. 
I want people who show up when things are very, very hard then show up when things get very, very hard. Again, I don't mean that to step on toes, folks, but we need to do that. People are expecting that from us as well. People need that from us. The same way we want it and need it, so do they. So let's be it as well. Protect that space for authenticity. Can we stand up? We're going to worship one more time here in a second. Um, But I want to pray with you guys, and I just want to pray that God comes in, and wherever we're at with our communities, that we allow him to move. We allow him to lead us and to guide us wherever we need to be to whoever we need in our lives. Maybe it's specific places. Maybe we're not good with accountability. Maybe God wants to send somebody to our lives. Say, God, can you send somebody my way that I can be honest with who's going to help me? Maybe we need encouragement. God, send somebody who can encourage me. We just need support. God, send somebody who can support me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you that we get to be here in your house. God, I thank you for making all of us. I thank you that you made not just a couple, Lord, not just just one, Lord, but you, you made all of us and your heart was that we would love one another, God, that we would love you and that we would love each other. And that speaks volumes to your heart for us, God, and to the truth that we were not created to, to, to figure this out ourselves, God, to try and achieve things ourselves or try to get through the hard stuff alone, God, but to do it together. And all of the strength that's in the midst, God, we'll never forget it. You get the glory, God. You send people our way. You give people the, the wisdom and the strength and, the, and all that they need to be our friends, to be our community, to give us what we need. It all comes from you. You get the glory. So thanks for working through us, God. Thanks for using us. Help us to let others into our lives, God, even if we've been hurt, even if we've been let down over and over again. Help us to find this new community, this authentic community that we can give a chance, Lord. Let it be from you because you will never let us down. You give us exactly what we need. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. We thank you again, God. We're gonna worship and we're excited to be here, God. We're excited for what you're gonna do in our lives, God. We believe that you're gonna move Holy Spirit in a way that only you can. So I pray that in this song, God, as we sit here, that we get excited about what you're getting ready to do, God, that we lift it up to you, we surrender to you, and we worship your mighty name. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. It's in your perfect name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we give Jesus some praise one more time, church? Come on.